All right, so hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. I'm Eric Meyer. I'm the same. Now, we're going to do something a little different today. So, uh, Eric, do you want to explain what's different about today's show? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, today, instead of, you know, talking about a new advancement in the web or, you know, a technology or even a thing that Egalia does, we're going to... We're going to talk about a set of conversations that's happening uh, in the community right now um, and a, sort of a, a branching tree of takes on, uh, you know, hot takes and spicy takes and maybe some lukewarm takes. But, well, we're not going to get into all of those, but where people are putting up posts and re replying to posts and posting about posts. And, um, you know, I, also we also, you know, we kind of want to talk about this as a it's something that happens a lot. It's kind of a recurring cycle um, uh, in our industry, maybe in all industries, but certainly in in the industry that we're in, um, where you know, like, there's suddenly there's a topic of conversation. It's the big story, and everyone's focused on it, um, and you know, saying, "Oh my gosh, I feel the same way," or "What's what are you talking about? That's completely wrong," or you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes replying to a different argument than the one that was initially made or the one of the rebuttals. Um, and, you know, sometimes splitting off into making tangentially related points. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and the current, the current uh, topic is frameworks and are they good or bad or you know have have we been sold a bill of goods as as some might put it or or not um which i mean when you get down to it this really it's talking about how we build websites right and maybe maybe about the complexity and how much complexity is appropriate for the task of building websites <clears throat> um and where that complexity should should lie um but that's, I mean, that's really what's, what's being talked about. Yeah. So it, it kind of starts with, uh, Alex Russell's post, the market for lemons. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know Alex, um, he is slightly late or slightly off depending on where you're, where you are. He's, those, he's always slightly those, to be, to be clear, those are his social media handles. Yeah. yeah. Not things we're not, not ways we're describing him. He, <laughs> he describes himself as either slightly late or slightly off in, right. in his handles. So, um, so, uh, he is currently from Microsoft, uh, formerly from Google, uh, also interestingly, formerly from Dojo. Uh, so, uh, you know, Dojo? I think that there's Dojo, do you know the, Dojo is the JavaScript library, early JavaScript library. Um, yeah, I actually I know that, but I wasn't sure how many listeners would remember Dojo. Right. Yeah, right. So, so that's an interesting thing because it was kind of a JavaScript um, framework, or was it a library? We'll get into that, I guess, yeah. later. But um, yeah, so or, or was it a toolkit? And, and it's none of those things. Uh, <laughs> and anyway, uh, his post the the market for lemons kind of launched the discussion um and we'll talk a little bit about what was in that but almost right. immediately it spawned a um a reply from Lori Voss right Lori uh currently at Netlify but who previously was a co-founder at NPM and was there a long time um before uh leaving and um I guess before that was at Yahoo Is yeah that, yeah. yeah for okay. a number of years at Yahoo right and you know they're both they they're both people who've been doing this web thing for a while like you know um almost as long as you and I have been doing it I think in in at least one case and uh they get a lot of they have a lot of people who follow them on social media um and uh I, th I think we could say both of them have some uh degree of uh bona fides when it comes to javascript yeah, yeah they they definitely both know where of they speak even though they publicly disagree pretty significantly in this particular area, hmm. which is always interesting because, you know, it's, it's not like one of them is coming from a position of ignorance, not at all, yeah. <laughs> completely the opposite. They both have been in the weeds and have been working in, in and around JavaScript for a long time. 
what they very much disagree on. It's interesting. I'd like to come back to that because I wonder if they do disagree as much as they appear to. But like, let's well, finish the 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 premise here uh, just to continue setting it up. Um, as soon as both of them had published something, uh, you know, now we have to like everybody's going to write something to sort of their sides are drawn, right? Mm. Uh, so there have to be the people offering some nuance and the people saying Alex is absolutely right. Uh, or Lori is absolutely right. Um, right. And so some other interesting posts that we picked out of this is one called, uh, the great gaslighting of the JavaScript era by Jared white. Right. On, on his post, the spicy web. So right. you, can, you can guess that it might, might be a hot take that that's his domain, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, another one we picked that, that we'll talk about is uh, the price developers pay for loving their tools too much. Mm. Um, that one by Brian Rinaldi. Yes. Yes. Um, so, um, and Brian Rinaldi is remotesynthesis.com. Um, mm. So, yeah. So let's get into uh, the market for lemons. Yeah. The, the thing that kicked it all off. Okay, so The Market for Lemons by Alex Russell. Um, basically, uh, the premise here is uh, talking about single-page applications. So it's not really about frameworks. Um, mm -hmm. It winds up being about frameworks because to build single-page applications, it's really handy to have a framework, right? Mm -hmm. um, Any framework so, in particular? or So... Uh, because one of these frameworks, I think it would be fair to say, has sort of um, dominates the, the discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, it is also taking the brunt of Alex's post. Although what I will say is Alex's writing style is uh, like a little bit, he includes a lot of footnotes and not short footnotes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, with some of the missing nuance you might feel is missing elsewhere in the post and it is not like exclusively talking about react um but uh react is the one that takes the brunt of it and the the premise of his post if we could just like boil it down is um we've all been hoodwinked bamboozled taken right um and not sort of naively um, where the the makers of the frameworks um, really just misunderstood or believed that like, like they were consciously knowingly misleading us is, is what Alex is saying is yeah. It's kind of Alex's uh, Alex's uh, premise. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, it's interesting, like the, the evidence that he provides and, and like the spin, the particular read is interesting. Um, I think we can not <laughs> take a, a, a very hard, uh, read on that either way. Um, but this leads to, uh, Lori's reply, which maybe you could introduce. Right. So Lori responded with a post called the case for frameworks, which, uh, you know, Lori says right up front is a direct response to the market for lemons where, uh, Lori basically says, Hey, frameworks are good. Um, and they exist for reasons, um, like good reasons and people use them for good reasons. Um, I don't think Lori is trying to say that all development should be done with frameworks and people who don't use, like, that's not the point that Lori is making. Um, there's, there's no gatekeeping in that sense, but it's just, you know, basically saying you haven't been hoodwinked. You haven't been bamboozled. You haven't been taken. You've been given a tool that was promoted um, by the people who created it because they felt that it solved problems and people use the tool because it solved problems. So they, they maybe are not the problems that everyone has, but it was a good solution for those problems, um, which, you know, and provides a lot of evidence. And, you know, as we, as we set up at the top of the show, I mean, Lori co-founded NPM, so has a lot of familiarity with 
sort of frameworks, package managers, you know, tools that assist, right? Um, things that make it easier for uh, users, in, in this case, developers, to manage the things that they need to manage. So, you know, is definitely coming from that that um, perspective and has seen, you know, lots of people installing libraries or frameworks or whatever um, and the reasons why they do that. And, you know, makes makes a strong case as Alex made a strong case. So. So what's interesting here is um, like, as Laurie says, Laurie actually agrees with Alex on a number, like basically the reason for this topic has to do with performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, the performance of single page applications um, is supposed to be better, right? Um, going all the way back to the Ajax era, like that's why we did Ajax in the first place, right? Because it, it felt better. It felt faster. Um, even in cases where you could measure and it was the same, there was this premise that somehow it still felt faster because the whole page didn't disappear in between, right? Um, but as we build these large single page applications, um, I guess that becomes untrue. You spend a really long time waiting for uh, anything. Yeah. Um, you have to wait for the markup to hydrate is that the what the kids say something about page hydration yeah i, I mean there are a lot of aspects to this and yeah. um and but that 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 thing about how you know frameworks are supposed to make your pages faster actually um that puts me in mind of a of a post that, that you mentioned uh, by dave rupert um that predates this whole conversation by a few weeks yeah. at least uh, called so you want to make a new J JS framework, and it's you know it's it's tongue in cheek. It's funny because Dave's funny, um, but it's also there's a lot of truth to it. And but one of the top things of the that he lists in the things you need if you're going to make a new JavaScript framework is you have to say that it's fast. And he very intentionally, and I think this is an interesting commentary, doesn't say what fast means because. Nobody actually knows what fast means. Yeah, and the the thing that I love about that is um, he also says you need like 10 influencers to get excited mm. about how yeah. fast it is. Right, um, exactly. And uh, what's interesting here is I think over, uh, Dave was on our show uh, just last time, I think. Was it mm. literally the last episode? I think so. Yeah, um, either the last with, or the one before. With Chris Coyer, who they do the Shop Talk Show together, which we love. And uh, a number of recent episodes of the Shop Talk Show have circled back on this. Um, what do you mean fast? Yeah, <laughs> there are right. a lot of things that fast could mean. And, and, and it also intertwines with Alex's points and with Lori's points, which have to do with developer experience, right? Developer experience being like how you feel writing the code and how easy it is for you to build and manage. And like one way you could be fast is it's, you know, rapid prototyping. Like you, mm. you can build things really fast with this. Yeah. Um, but the page itself might be really slow from the user's perspective. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, one could write a framework that was the other way around. Although. Absolutely. I'm Absolutely. not sure how much adoption that would get because developers would complain that it was difficult in some way, even though it was really fast for users. Um, but yeah, you could. Frameworks usually don't do that, though. I mean, frameworks are, from my perception of them, are usually created to make life easier for the developer. And whether or not they make life easier for the user is usually at best a second thought, not in, I suppose not in every single case. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to damn all frameworks as, you know, and cast them all in the same light, but it, things like accessibility and, and speed of page rendering and, you know, stuff like that, um, particularly on low powered devices um, is generally not a consideration in, frameworks that I have seen 
or doesn't seem to have been. And sometimes that stuff gets added later, but it's always added later, kind of the same way that happened with Flash, where Flash was had this like beautiful authoring environment. Um, Flash, for those of you who don't remember, is a mid 1990s to early 2000s uh, technology that, um, yeah, had this great authoring environment. Um, I knew people who loved uh, working in Flash because they could just like create animations on a timeline. They didn't have to try to figure out how to do it themselves. Um, they could just point and click basically, which nothing wrong with that. I, I get it. Um, they could draw interfaces um, and things were consistent in terms of rendering. Um, it was very binary uh, rendering experience. You either got the experience that the designer slash developer had created for you, or you got nothing like that was it. Um, it was, it was uh, only, only available to those who had the flash plugin, which for a while was most everybody on the web, not exactly everybody, but very close anyway. Um, and then it was only years after flash had become really popular that people started to say, okay, but what about people who are, you know, have vision impairment and can't read the nine point text that the flash developer created, like what can they do? Um, and Adobe did eventually start adding in accessibility features or hooks or, or whatever you want to call it to, to flash, um, that came rather late in flash's life cycle. Uh, but I wrote in, I wrote a, uh, a series called like history of the web. Mm -hmm. And, uh, in that it's just, I only did five parts. I wanted to do sort of early part. And really the reason that I wanted to write it had something to do with, um, I, I wanted to show the origin of where flash came from, uh, because it like predates the web. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, like it, it's purpose wasn't to be flash. It was actually for something else. Like, um, Hmm. But anyway, I as I finished writing, I, it turned out that uh, Rick Waldron um, had written a, a really good piece on the whole history of Flash. But like, yeah, it's phenomenally interesting, like its origins and how it came about. You you mentioned Adobe, but like it didn't start at Adobe; it was acquired. And yeah. um, and it uh like like you say like they they did begin to address like accessibility um another complaint about it was that it was like proprietary right um but there was like an open implementation of it and there was an effort to standardize it actually um but it yeah. came really late after it was probably too late you yeah. know um right but anyway, yeah, it's if you if you have a chance to go find Rick's uh thing or or go read mine um, there, I think it's fantastically interesting history there, but, um, yeah, you, you mentioned this and this is part of the subject of the price developers pay for loving their tools too much. Mm. Um, uh, the other post that we were talking about by, um, Brian Rinaldi, right. right. Um, yeah, and you know, he says, um, I I learned this lesson in my career to sort of not love your tools too much because um mm -hmm. I thought Flash was fantastic and I loved using it and I like threw myself into it. HTML like HTML five didn't exist at the time and, and HTML was like not very good, <laughs> you know? Like it lacked a lot of capabilities. Um like CSS three didn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was a really basic medium and, and it seemed like flash let mm -hmm. you do good things and it worked in every browser. So um, it, it was really, really interesting and you could do lots of creative things with it. And so for, uh, I think he said uh, more than a decade of his life, that was what he did, right? Like he was the expert in flash stuff and he yeah. made a career out of that. Mm -hmm. And then Steve Jobs said, nah. <laughs> yeah, no flash on iPhone. Right. He said, no flash for you. And that, that was it. Within less than a year, um, his decade or more of flash reflex experience was over, literally from one day to the next. And mm -hmm. um, 
yeah. So he had to, you know, retool. Um, I think the interesting thing about this article that goes into though, is, um, thing that I think we like innately know, but don't think about this way. <laughs> um, like in, in this terms of detail, I, I really like this thing that he added here, which is, you know, we talk about eras and we talk about like, um, or we, you know, we, we like to talk about decades, like the 2010s, you know, mm. the 1980s, the 1990s. Right. Um, but those are just arbitrary dates that end in a zero. And we like that, you know, they have nothing to do with a connection to reality, right? Like somebody born in, you know, 1990, do they have like more in common with somebody born in 1989 or 1991? <laughs> neither mm -hmm. right like it's the same more or less mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so uh but here he gets into like if you look at because the trend of you know people writing software and the things that we do keeps increasing more people are like being taught more people are entering the workforce um we do over time wind up with like a curve in which a lot of people are predisposed to generally the same like background and like mm. outlook. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like there's a narrative that comes and, and, um, and so he's saying that right now there are plenty of people who have not known a world without react and, and yeah. we like, we sell them react as the interesting um, thing that they need to learn. And we have boot camps and, um mm -hmm. yeah anyway his his point is um you know don't pin your career on a single framework um like understand that things change and um it's difficult but you know don't try to not be so narrow in, in the thing that you throw all of your insight behind right right yeah and i like i liked also what he said about how um, you know, just because a tool loses favor, you know, the way that other past tools have, uh, doesn't mean that you're completely done. Like the things that you learned in using that tool, many of those skills will be transferable. You know, the exact syntax might change, but the, the, the general principles and the sort of the, those sorts of skills that you learned using, you know, React. For example, once React becomes passe and there's a new round of people saying, oh, nobody uses React anymore. We use other thing. We use Asteroid now. I just made up a framework name. There's probably a framework called Asteroid. And if there is, I don't know what it does. But anyway, um, yeah, it, because I, I think it was in Brian's post where he was saying, um, you know, once upon a time, you couldn't get hired unless you knew jQuery. And mm -hmm. then, and there was a time where for a lot of jobs, you couldn't get hired unless you knew Flash. But, you know, jQuery was absolutely essential for for developer resumes for a while. And then it became not essential. Um, you know, a Angular became essential for a while. You had to know Angular. And then... Mm. That became not essential, and recently it's been you have to know React. If React isn't on your on your resume, you're going to have a hard time getting a job. But it it's time too is likely to fade. Um, but the people who learned jQuery or the people who learned Angular were probably you know able to learn React if if they wanted to. Yeah, uh, you know because they had already they had some experience working in a in a framework style environment, and they had experience working with JavaScript and working with the web. And so, you know, a lot of those skills were transferable. Um, yeah. Almost nothing is just like a complete, um, like reboot of every idea. Almost, almost everything yeah. is iterations on ideas that came before. Right. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. Like if you learned C it's okay. a lot easier to learn Java, JavaScript, <laughs> Like mm -hmm. all of the C family languages have similar uh, yeah. ideas. Yeah. And even the ones that aren't C family languages have an awful lot of similarities. Right. So yeah. learning one thing, like it doesn't like learning the first thing is harder 
And then after mm -hmm. that, a lot of those concepts just slightly reshape or, um, you know, get a little nicer in some areas or something, but, um, they're largely portable in my experience. Um, right. And if so you use one templating language, you can figure out any templating language, for example, right? Yeah. Generally speaking, um, or, you know, figure out that, oh, it, I guess this templating language doesn't do that thing that my past template templating language did, but it does all these other things that the other one didn't. Yeah. Sure. I, yeah. You, you can always are, if you are so motivated, you can always make, make the, the step, you know, plenty of people started out learning PHP and now would not touch PHP with a 10 foot cattle prod. But, um, but the, the things that they learned in learning PHP helped them learn, you know, whatever it was that they learned next, whether it was JavaScript or, or Python or, or whatever, right. And like programming languages to a large extent are programming languages. And you have to, you have to look to the sort of the novelty languages um, like OOK before you really start to break things down. Um, white, white space. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I think this is a good place to transition to Jared White, the spicy web, <laughs> mm. um, because I like I wonder if you didn't like mix those two in your mind a little bit. Um, it, a lot it's of things that did. a lot of things that you're talking about are from the great gaslighting JavaScript era, or at least they hit similar notes. Um, mm. So yeah, I mean, if there's any question about like why this one is being written, like it also literally says, "Hey." Alex Russell wrote this, Lori Voss wrote this, and I agree with Alex, right? Like, um, mm, Jared, basically, Jared does, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so his thing is like coming from a completely different angle, and it's like he's saying he's mad, he's mad actually. He was a Ruby on Rails developer, mm. um, and uh, when Angular came along, people told him. Angular is the future. Um, your skills are no longer required. Right. You need to retool. And and why? You know, um, the message was join the Angular movement or become a dinosaur. Right. Um, and he said, do you know what I find highly ironic these many years later? My skills as a Ruby on Rails developer today are by far more valuable than the skills I would have gained pivoting to full-time Angular JavaScript development in 2014. Um, because the future was not in fact angular and uh, it was maybe react, but here are all these problems with react. So it says, you know, we were fed a line. It was a lie. It was all lies, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, basically, uh, there's a lot here. Yeah. I can understand where that feeling would come from, I guess. Mm-hmm. To some extent. Yeah. All right. So this is really about something rather specific that it started out as, which is like a particular kind of JavaScript framework around creating SPAs. Right. And by SPA, single page application? Is that yeah. A... Right. Okay. Um, Sorry. There's too many three-letter acronyms in my life. Yeah. So I have to... There are way too many TLAs. Um, yeah. So the reason that I'm like making this point is I would like to also note that um, we have a lot of data from things that look at millions and millions and millions, like hundreds of millions of websites, billions of websites. Mm. And um, you, mean, you mean, are you talking like browser stats or? Yeah. I'm talking about like, um, like the internet archive. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And, React is very little of it. Of the web? Yeah. I mean, but of the thing that is the public web, they're, you know, dominated by more traditional technologies. Um, or, or or basically, they're not dominated by React specifically. Let's, let's just say that. Okay. Um, not even a little bit. And I think that Alex is like most cross about people who use it for that. And I think rightly so. But that web is actually comparatively small compared to the 
the web where you have to log in and maybe is even behind corporate internet. Okay. So like companies that I have worked for in the past have had, you know, one, two, maybe three or four like regular web websites, hmm. but like a couple of hundred internal intranet websites. And those are different, right? I mean, we, we think about them different. We optimize them different because in many ways, like we're the clients, you know? Um, right. So like here hmm. at Egalia, we have internal tools, which are delivered primarily via the web. And if we're building one of them and it like took a second, we're not real stressed out about that. Right. Like, cause we're like, I'll just wait another second. It's okay. Mm. We don't stress about like SEO because well, I mean, you have to log in anyway. Um, and well, they're not to be indexed by a public crawler. Right. Like, right. so yeah, they're just like very, very different concerns. And I have a sense from the, my involvement that like really, really, really a lot of the use of react and angular and ember and you know like all the the big sort of um frameworky things that you can use to build a single page app um like they're for not the public web uh, mm -hmm. i think there are a lot of those and so there are a lot of developers and maybe that's kind of okay and i, and I think you can see some of Lori's points when it comes to those things because uh, you don't want to spend a lot of money on those. You want to be able to hire people and have them know what, <laughs> mm. what is the technology behind this? Um, mm -hmm. maybe you do in many of those cases want it to be like installable, you know, where it wants to be more of a feel like an app in, in all the ways, you know, mm. I wonder how much of, I want, like, I wonder how much people really are making react sites on the public web and like why, why they're doing that too. Like, I wonder if it's like spillover because you have people who just happen to have a lot of react experience now and they maybe, maybe some of them don't even know another way and they get tasked with making a public site and there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I went and I looked up, I went out went and looked at the HTTP archives web almanac since you you mentioned the the usage of of these various frameworks and uh yeah I hadn't looked at this year's and I'm actually a little shocked react is 8% hmm. jquery is 81% yeah um, yeah and and I think that's a big uptake for react though actually <laughs> it, it um I think they said something about possibly it plateaued I don't know. I'm I'm just looking at the at the uh, at the chart here. Um, yeah, they're probably. I mean, you're probably right. There probably are internal developers or internet developers who then get told, "Hey, you know this web stuff. You put stuff in browsers. We need to put stuff in other people's browsers. Go do the thing." And they use React because that's what they know. That's what they learned in bootcamp, and that's what they've been working on. And it's real fast to knock that out. And it makes sense to them. Um, so yeah, there, there, there could be, um, yeah, I mean, developing internally, I get that there are shop standards for lack of a better term, you yeah. know, where this is what we use in the shop. If you know it, great. And then we can hire you or, you know, if you don't know it, then we need to build in training time or whatever. But anyway, yeah, there's a place like Facebook has very specific, you know, performance and uh, real time refresh and other concerns that most sites don't have. Like agalia.com does not need the same kind of timeline refresh that facebook.com does. Um, and it doesn't. Here, here's a hot take. I don't think Facebook needs it either. <laughs> well, okay. But the Facebook felt that they needed. But, yeah, you no, know, I, you know we, we don't need to be able to have a social sharing in the same way, you know, cnn.com, wikipedia.com, right? Just to, or my personal website or your personal website, like don't yeah. need what React was invented to solve. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like YouTube. It's not everything. Um, yeah. And I would love to see more of who's using it for what. Um, it would be nice if it were 
like <laughs> easy to go look at that and look at some of the things that Alex is looking at stack traces on. I, I actually have seen a couple of them <laughs> and um, mm. it like, you know, they are pretty bad actually. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I, I think that that's an interesting thing that I think that there are actually very, kind of okay appropriate uses of react and i think that the arguments that laurie makes are like more appropriate for those use cases than they are for the like public websites the sort of public pages of public websites that are are, are indexed by these things i think eight percent is just too high for <laughs> for that um mm -hmm. anyway we, we were talking about how this is like a, a phenomenon that we, you know we something captures our attention and, and like frequently it's not just a spicy post. It's like a spicy post and then a reply to a spicy post. Mm -hmm. And like some core there is resonating, do you know, like, mm -hmm. um, so, um, I, I don't want to get into a whole nother one. Um, but <laughs> it, I know I noted to you that it, it reminds me of a, a different one in the past. And I have written this, this post called the glory days of the web. Um, mm -hmm. My post was in reply to a post by Deanna Almer. Back which in was, 2016. Back in 2016, which was in reply to um, another post, uh, which was in reply to another post. <laughs> and <laughs> where I think it begins is this uh, post called It's the Future by Paul Bigger. Mm. Um, and it, it's kind of interesting. It, it's mostly about like um, not the web but um like containerization and things like that um but that spawned this other post by uh jose aguanagua mm -hmm. that i will encourage you all to go read it's called how it feels to learn javascript in 2016 yeah a classic and it even has a thing where you can click it and it'll read it to you and it's great but this what's interesting about this is like this is very early in react days right um and yeah. when you like, I know every, this resonated with everybody. Like everybody was like all over this. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, when I go back and look at this now, though, the thing that's interesting to me, like the premise is it's just too complicated. We have built way too much complexity. Like th this is impossible. Like it's really impossible to learn. Um, but when you go back and look at that article, um, it has React and JSX. But then the other things that it's added to like, oh my God, that's too complicated is um, ES 2016, NPM, Promises, Fetch, Async Await, uh, Babel, the term functional programming, and TypeScript. And like, I don't think any of those are scary to many people anymore. I mean, like, it's great because almost all of those are standards, right? Um. And yeah. when you can when you can get everything baked down to standards, well, that's pretty nice because like fetch is going to be around a long, long, long time. the The concepts that are baked into promises and async await, like they're going to be there for your whole career, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're simple premises that you can learn and build on and and apply. And like every framework or library or anything that you want to do on the web is going to deploy those things so i don't know it's just interesting to look back you know and, and think about even though it, it seemed like very overwhelming um it's because like the bleeding edge of things is kind of overwhelming right yeah it usually is so i think you know that's this part of it is that like most people were trying to get on the bleeding edge too early maybe mm -hmm. uh we we're having a big adjustment there but um the other thing is my piece and Dion's piece uh, both talk about um, like it's not a lot of people are feeling this is newly complex, but it's not newly complex. We've just moved to complexity, right? Mm. Um, like Ruby on Rails is not not complex. Yeah, it is very complex. PHP is very complex. JSP, ASP, all of these are like things upon which there are like many additional frameworks and tools and libraries and UI toolkits built, you know, with their own philosophies and, and that that's not new. I mean, that goes all the way back to like 
the first the the CERN phone book was a, a very complicated program, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, it was it was written in C. It like it was, you know, query databases and and it was not like you know Tim and the folks at CERN like sat down and wrote a lot of HTML, you know. Like Tim right. didn't even like writing HTML. His browser didn't even let you. You could author pages, but you couldn't see the HTML. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, that that's uh, that's all I have to offer on the subject. How about you? Yeah, I mean, I think what this is not our first rodeo, <laughs> as okay. I think we've made clear during this. You know, we've seen these cycles come and go. There, there were these arguments or discussions or debates, whatever you want to call it, about jQuery, about Angular, about stuff I've probably forgotten about flash going back beyond the, the sort of realm of JavaScript itself. Um, and I think, I mean, I, the field is so new in a historical sense that I think this is inevitable. And I think this is going to keep happening. Right. Um, in the same way that when, electrification happened or started happening there were a lot of debates about what kind of current should be used and how should how should the um wires be strung and what kinds of sockets should should be used and there were a lot of different approaches to that this is a similar process where we're still figuring out what should this system do and the difference here i think is that we have the ability to write in the things that are that aren't there that we think should be there, right? So jQuery had a bunch of stuff um, that made selecting elements easier, and some of them are now becoming stuff like the has pseudo class selector that um, we helped to land in, in browsers just recently. Um, jQuery had that you know a decade decade and a half before because people wanted it and it wasn't there in CSS and it took a really long time to figure out how to get it into CSS, but it got there. That's why people use less in SAS because they can nest uh, CSS selectors or they can, uh, they, you know, before there were CSS custom properties, they can have variables and they can still have variables and they could have mix-ins to tint uh, colors. And those sorts of things are slowly making their way into native CSS. But, you know, we're, we're, able to craft advancements to the field using things like frameworks or libraries or preprocessors or, or whatever. Um, and so I, th I this is going to continue for a while. I mean, it may not ever stop basically because this is such a, it's such a new frontier. I mean, we, yeah. sometimes we feel like, Oh, like web development is settled. We know how that works. We really don't. <laughs> we, we just don't like, we haven't, we haven't even figured it out yet. We, we still keep, People still keep coming up with, you know, CSS, HTML, and, and JavaScript doesn't have these things built in, but I can use JavaScript or, you know, some language on the server side where, where necessary. That could be JavaScript or it could be something else to make this thing happen that the base technology doesn't do yet. And, you know, we're, we're just going to keep seeing this. And yeah. Uh, we'll see these cycles, you know, react, like I think we said earlier, react will eventually fall from favor, fall quote unquote from favor, but it's not going to go away. Right. It's not like react will suddenly cease to work one day. Um, people still use jQuery, right? jQuery never went away. It just became not the hot topic and it became sort of a, oh, we've moved on to a new thing. Okay. But the old thing's still there and you can still use the old thing. Sort of like HTML, right? <laughs> you could still use HTML. It's still there. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, th I think I think this will continue. And some of the points that 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 Brian made, Brian Rinaldi made about you know don't fall so in love with a tool that you can't let go of it. Um, those are those are well taken. And and always, if you come to a moment, if you come to an inflection point where it feels like oh my god, everything that I have learned is now, you know, passe in the past, I'm going to have to learn a whole new way of doing things. It's not a whole new way of doing things. It, there will be some differences, but the things that you've already learned will, will, will carry you forward. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll continue to have this discussion. And 
That's not to say it's not stressful, even for people who oh, sure. through it many Absolutely. times. Uh, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. I'm stressful. constantly feeling like, oh my God, I cannot. There's so many things that are new. How can I keep up? Um, right. yep. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, all, that's all true. But it's, I, think, I think to some extent we should welcome these sorts of debates, even as stressful and these sorts of changes, as stressful as they may be, because they do indicate that we're learning as a as a as a field as an industry we're learning what's what's needed and what's not needed um in some cases and uh the the things that are needed and that are proven out to be widely wanted because lots of people use them make their way into the standard technologies and so you know experimenting and having debates about is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? What are the implications of, of new thing X being baked into the, the sort of foundational layer? Those are all, those are all really good. So, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's a, a good place to wrap up. Yeah. So thanks for joining us on this uh, meandery <laughs> set of topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that is at least pretty interesting. Anything you want to say? Yeah. Just thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody.